Would you turn in your Bibles to the first letter of Paul to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to be reading together verses 12 to 17. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17 will be our study. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, pros persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of the Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is, were trustworthy and deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the foremost, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience and ex and as an example to those who were to believe on him for eternal life, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. What a wonderful passage of scripture. And as you see, as we read through this passage, this really is the testimony of the Apostle Paul. And the title, if you want a title for our sermon today, would simply be Grace Overflowing. Grace Overflowing. So this is verses 12 to 17, this section we consider the testimony of the Apostle Paul, how he views himself and how by God's grace we see a man through the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit, became the greatest apostle and defender of the faith from previously being a bloodthirsty persecutor of the disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's just briefly remind ourselves of the context in this letter of Paul to Timothy. Following that wonderful introduction, where Paul affectionately refers to Timothy as his son, and the greeting to Timothy, Paul said about immediately warning Timothy and the church about false teachers, particularly with regard to the law. And in verses 8 to 11, which we looked at, we observed teaching regarding the proper use and the improper use of the law of God. And in verse 11, Paul stresses the proper use of the law is in accordance and must always lead to the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is Paul's style as he now talks about the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ after talking about the law, which is our schoolmaster to Christ. And so it's almost like he can't help himself. He can't uh, stop himself by digressing a little bit again by the Holy Spirit. And this is what brings the subject matter before us, where Paul pauses to extol the magnitude of the gospel of grace. And, we'll, and we will see it begins with the magnitude of God's grace to him personally in verses 12 to 14. And Paul extends this grace principle further to the world, not only to him, but to the world. In that verse we considered last time, just before Christmas, as a reminder, as a reason for the incarnation. Verse 15 the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I, Paul, am the foremost. And then Paul ends this little digression, this section, by giving praise to the God of grace in a powerful and emotional doxology in verse 17. Let's consider this passage and uh, we looked at verse 15 a couple of weeks back, and we may come back to this next week because this certainly is a very full passage of Scripture. We'll consider our text this morning under three headings, and we have six lessons and applications at the end that come out of uh, our three points. Firstly, we observe in the first place, Saul, 
Now that I call him Saul, the persecutor and the worst of sinners. Saul, the persecutor and the worst of sinners. Nobody likes to visit the memory of past sins and failures, and we all have them in our lives, and some worse than others, and some terrible sins and failures, and more so when we're a believer, when we sin against the light, we sin against gospel grace, we do not want to remember those sins once we've repented of them, as well as our sin and rebellion before we came to Christ in our past lives, and you may be raised in a Christian home and not have this terrible past, but you know what I'm talking about. There's still sin and rebellion in your heart, and you still rejected the Savior, and you still love pleasure and the things of this world before coming to Christ. And when we recall past sins, we recall them with shame, as do most of the saints in the Scripture. Think of Peter and his denial of the Savior. That lived with them, and how he must have hated that thought and those things before him, that terrible sin. And it's no wonder the psalmist in Psalm 25 and verse 7 implores God and he says, Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions, please, Lord. Don't remember those terrible things that I have done. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. And yet we find here that Paul in this letter to Timothy a letter, a letter which was supposed to be written or re re read rather to the churches, which was the idea, and that's clear as we study this letter. Now he writes this, his past life, his testimony, for all to recall. He puts it in paper and the Holy Spirit gets him to write it down. Paul remembers and dwells on his former sins. Look at verse 13a, though formerly... I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. Not only does he recall them, but he shares them. And he describes himself as the foremost of sinners. I'm the worst. I'm the worst, says Paul. And in that great verse 15 I read earlier, where we consider the purpose of the incarnation, he again reflects on the fact that he is at the top of the list of sinners, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, the glorious gospel of which I am the foremost, says Paul. And others think, well, if Paul thinks he's the worst of sinners, what am I? This is not false humility on Paul's part or boasting about how bad he was, even though now he is an apostle, that people may stand in awe of his great improvement. No, Paul also hates his past sin, but his purpose in recalling his sinful past is to highlight and magnify the superabounding grace of God to him. In Christ Jesus, it was shown to him, as we'll see in verse 14 in a moment. The truth is, Paul tells it like it is without soft peddling what he was and what he did, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecuted, insolent, insolent, insolent opponent. Firstly, he was a blasphemer. Paul, or Saul, the Pharisee, was a blasphemer who denied Christ and forced us and others to do the same. We see this in Acts, and Paul speaks about these shameful sins of the past in other parts of the scripture. In Acts chapter 26, verse 11, he says, and I punished them, Christians, in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. And I thought of an incident when I read this. Paul was fired up. He was ready to destroy Christians. And, and I thought of an incident back in South Africa when I worked in engineering. One of my colleagues was involved in the incident of road rage. And he did something, and the driver was really upset, and he responded in a way that we shouldn't. In any event, this guy pursued him right across town, and he tried to shake him. Eventually, he came into the office, and I just turned at the entrance to the office and saw that 
This guy jumped out of the car and he raced over to him in great fury. He was ready to destroy him. Uh, and poor Anton, the, the sales rep, I say poor, uh, not really knowing what happened, he pulled out his gun. And he was ready to, to defend himself, but he was really just trying to chase him away. And I ran outside and managed to get the guy to defuse that. But that kind of fury that we see in road rage, road rage, even in this country, this is what Paul was filled with. This righteous indignation against sinners. He was truly a blasphemer. He was also a persecutor by his relentless pursuit of the Lord's people. He persecuted the Lord himself. That's what the scriptures tell us in Acts 22, verse 4 and verse 7. You needn't turn there. He said, I persecuted this way to death, binding and delivering them to prison, both men and women. And in verse 7, he says, and I fell to the ground. That's when the Lord arrested Paul. And I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? He was also a persecutor of the Lord's people. Thirdly, he described himself in his former life as an insolent opponent and a man of violence. When we think of the Apostle Paul and we read his writings, we think, wow, was he really that bad? Acts 9, verse 1 and 2. Listen to Luke's description as he remembers and he quotes Paul. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that he, if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. A hundred mile trip to get these Christians. And then there, it started with Stephen, of course, the first martyr. Saul was there in those early days, holding the clothes of those who were about to, st to stone Stephen and was in agreement with what was happening there. And from that time, he became a fiery opponent, a bloodthirsty man, imprisoning disciples. He would be the first to consent to their death as determined by the Sanhedrin in the Jewish temple. Saul truly was these things. On account of them, he calls himself the foremost of sinners. He, in his own estimation, would be the first. He, he, he on account of them, calls himself the foremost of sinners, and in his own estimation, the worst. As we observe in verse 15 of him, of whom I am the foremost. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he writes to them in 15 and verse 9, find the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. I'm the foremost. I'm the worst kind of sinner you can get. His letter to the Ephesians in chapter 3 and verse 8, to me, though I am the very least of the saints, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. We observe in the second place, that's Paul's former life. Observe in the second place, Paul the apostle and recipient of God's overflowing grace. Paul the apostle and recipient of God's overflowing grace. Look at verse 12 to 15 again. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. Because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. He was appointed an apostle, a late apostle, directly by the Lord Jesus Christ. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of the Lord overflowed to me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. And the saying in Paul is glory in the gospel is true and trustworthy and worthy of all full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the foremost. Paul opens these verses with thanksgiving to God, especially considering his terrible crimes against the church. And as we know, Christ Jesus appears to Paul on the Damascus Road 
opens his eyes to his great ignorance, opens his eyes to his blasphemy, and calls him out as a persecutor of himself in the persecution of his disciples. Let me remind you there, Paul, on the Damascus Road, Saul, rather, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. What? And the sword of the Spirit comes with the word of Christ and cuts Saul to the quick. The one I blasphemed is the one I'm persecuting is the Lord. But rise and enter the city, you'll be told what you, to do, what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground. Although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Broken man, broken man. The risen and ascended Lord Jesus Christ appears to Paul. And the word of Christ through powerful working of the Holy Spirit arrests Paul. Showing him his great sin in persecuting the church. And how the sin amounts to persecuting Christ Jesus himself. And all Saul's zealous pharisaical righteousness seemed to be drained instantly with the weight and burden of of his sin revealed to himself by the words, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Saul was full of energy, persecuting the church, and suddenly nothing. And he's blind, physically blind. And he lies, wallowing in the thought of his sin against the Lord for three days, not eating or drinking. How this humbling and conviction of sin through the word of Christ, that sharp-edged sword of Christ's word that divides bone and marrow like a skillful butcher's knife, how this experience of repentance and faith and coming to a knowledge of Christ will sap a man of all his strength and his previously misplaced vigor and passion. And Paul was laid in the dust. Paul is blinded. Paul is humbled. Paul is brought to see the horror of his own sin for three days in this condition. And how does God respond to this insolent opponent, this bloodthirsty man who persecutes his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, by showering him with a superabundance of grace, overflowing grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then you may have scene, we encounter what appears to be a confusing statement, in fact, two apparently confusing statements in his testimony, and perhaps it caught your eye. The first one is verse 12, I thank him who has given me strength, that we know he needed strength, he was laid low in his repentance and coming to faith in Christ, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful appointing me to his service. Christ Jesus gives him strength, appointing him to be an apostle because Christ judged him faithful. Well, Saul certainly was not faithful. Yes, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He talks about that later. Regarding the law, he was blameless. But as we have seen, he was a blasphemer. And he forced others to blaspheme against the Son of God, denying the Messiah of God so clearly prophesied in the Old Testament, of which Paul was a scholar in the best school available in Gamaliel's school. Or you may think incorrectly that God judged him faithful because he would prove his faithfulness, which God would see in the future. I don't think that's it. And the second confusion is around verse 13 and the last part. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And this text seems to imply that his sin was not so bad because God judged him faithful and because he was ignorant of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that's why Jesus gave him strength and mercy. I don't think so. 
I quote, Sommel writes, on one level, Paul knew exactly what he'd been doing. He'd been wreaking violence and even death on the followers of Christ. He was responsible for his sin. On another level, he was not culpable because he acted ignorantly in unbelief. Negatively, he was ignorant of Jesus' real messianic statement. Status. Positively, as a sincere Pharisee, he truly believed he was serving God by stamping out this false messianic sect called Christians. But Paul was not saying that he acted ignorantly in unbelief as if he had earned him, as if this had earned him mercy. Rather, it meant that it did not disqualify him from receiving mercy from Christ. He had not knowingly defied God and with what the Old Testament calls sins of the high hand, purposeful defiance against God. You could read about that in Numbers chapter 15. So what's the bottom line? Paul did not deserve mercy. Yet on the Damascus road, he received mercy. Because if ignorance was ever an excuse, lawlessness would abound to no end, wouldn't it? Most court cases will be thrown out. Your Honor, I didn't know the law. The perfect law of God would be ineffective. The wages of sin always was and still is death apart from the grace of Christ. And what is sin but want of conformity and transgression of the law of God? Ignorance does not change the law or the severity of the punishment for transgression. Even a lack of understanding of the law still makes you culpable to bear the full weight of the law, of, of, of the, the punishment, even after rehabilitation. It is never rewarded. You have simply done what is required of you when you obey the law. So what is the real answer? The real answer is given to us in verse 14. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Nothing that he did, but it's the mercy, the grace of our Lord that overflowed to him with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. And John Bunyan's book, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, is in fact on this verse 14 right here. Brothers and sisters, to answer to both apparent confusions is shown in the overflowing grace of the Lord to Paul. Grace to repent and to believe. Grace to respond to the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. It is the grace of Christ overflowing to Paul that would make him faithful. It was the eyes of faith through the powerful working of the Holy Spirit that fell upon Saul that opened not his physical eyes but his spiritual eyes so that he could see his former ignorance of Christ. Brothers and sisters, think of your own life. It is the overflowing grace of Christ that made him faithful. It was this illuminating grace by the grace of the Holy Spirit in the new birth that removed the ignorance like a veil through the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. And this is what is important. There is no notion or hint of any merit on our part for the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, whether faithfulness or ignorance. Faithfulness to Christ is created by the overflowing grace in Christ Jesus. Ignorance is lifted through the illumination of the Spirit of God that causes by faith to trust, trust in Christ and Him alone for our salvation. Where does Paul say this so very clearly? This is for us, brothers and sisters, for you and for me. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, not a result of works so that no one could boast. And Paul expressed the facts with careful, careful precision in Romans 5, verse 20 and 21. Listen to these words. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. 
so that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You turn from darkness to light. Brothers and sisters, our new birth by the Spirit, the state of being dead in our trespasses and sins, is always and only and exclusively because of the overflowing grace of Christ Jesus. Consider Horatio Bonar's hymn, that great hymn, Not what my hands have done can save my guilty soul, not what my toiling flesh has borne can make my spirit whole, not what I feel or do can give me peace within, not all my prayers and sighs and tears can bear my awful load. Thy work alone, O Christ, can ease this weight of sin. Thy blood alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace within. Thy love to me, O God, not mine, O Lord, to thee, can rid me of this dark unrest and set my spirit free. And that is what Paul knew. That was for was, was Saul's personal testimony. There was no faithfulness or merit in Paul. There is never a valid excuse for ignorance that can remove the guilt of our sin, but only the overflowing grace of God to us. The faithfulness and the merit were only Christ's perfect obedience in accomplishing salvation for us by giving of himself upon the cross. And the recollection of this truth causes Paul by the Spirit to declare this faithful saying, worthy of full acceptance, not me. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I am the worst of which I am the foremost. And if our testimony of God and his salvation does not start and finish with the overflowing grace of Christ to us, we cannot possibly be saved. For it is by grace that you are saved through faith. No amount of faithful service in the law and the ignorant service of God outside of Christ merits anything without the overflowing grace that is in Christ Jesus. That was Paul's testimony. But we must ask the question now before we move to our final point. Why would Paul recount all these great crimes against the church, this persecution of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Why would he put it out there for all to see? Things he regretted deeply and was profoundly ashamed of. Was he boasting of his previous wickedness, as some men do, with regard to their former way of life, to draw attention to themselves? Or in boasting about their reform? See what I was. See what I am now. The great apostle. No. There is but one reason. And the Holy Spirit gives that reason to us. Which brings us to the third and final place. Number three. Paul on display. As a trophy of God's grace. Praises the God of grace. Paul on display. As a trophy of God's grace praises the God of grace. Look at verse 16 and 17 with me. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, as the worst, the worst of the worst, and Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever. Amen. I hate talking about this, but God has told me to show you what I was, that, I might, that you might see that I'm a trophy of his grace, that his superabounding grace has given me strength, has appointed me as an apostle, a faithful apostle, that you might see that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, that others may believe on account of the Lord's faithfulness and forbearance and long-suffering with the chief of all sinners. In Titus 3, Paul describes what happens to the sinner. Titus, uh, first, uh, Titus 3, verse 4 to 7, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, 
not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. By the washing of regeneration, renewal by the Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of of eternal life. Again in Ephesians 2 and verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. To that end and that end only may people see what we were and what we become because of the overflowing grace of Christ Jesus and no other reason. The point is the outpouring of God's grace and the grace of Christ upon a man proclaims the richness of his mercy of God towards the worst sinner, even Paul. There is no sin in a man that renders grace ineffective. There is no sin in a man that renders grace ineffective but turns the worst into trophies of grace and heirs prepared to receive the eternal life. And here in our text, it particularly mentions that Paul's life is a showcase of the patience and forbearance of God against the utmost of sinners. My friends, if you're here today, no matter what you've done, God's grace is sufficient. His overabundant mercy covers Your sin, the worst of sin. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ on our lives, brothers and sisters, from the worst of us, are to be a showcase to those who are yet to believe on him for eternal eternal life. Trophies of God's grace. That is why Paul is ready to call himself the foremost of sinners. For he believed he was and the very things that torment him and embarrass him are a showcase, an example to those who are yet to believe. None, none are so far gone that thou beyond the overflowing grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what Paul is doing, extolling the superabundant grace of God in his life as the rest of sinners. And you today may sit here and think of the things that you have done And if you're honest, you would also say, I'm the worst of the worst. I'm the worst of sinners. And perhaps you've come to church. Perhaps you're eager to hear and listen. And you want to have the joy that others have. You want to have the assurance of salvation and eternal life. But if anyone knew my life, if anyone knew what I did in the past, brothers and sisters, Paul's life is a trophy of God's grace to those who are yet to believe. In him for eternal life. And as this letter closes, Paul can do no other in response to this overflowing grace to him is the worst of the worst. He bursts forth in a doxology to Christ, to the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, Christ to my persecuted, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. What a wonderful testimony of Paul. And I ask you today, what is your testimony? What is your testimony? Not of what Christ did for you only many years ago when you came to Christ. What is your testimony this week of what Christ has done for you? Because there was a superabounding amount of grace to you. But did you see it? Did you burst forth in praise as Paul's did? at a recollection of God's grace to you. Finally, as we close, let's consider six lessons and applications. Six lessons and applications that we have time. Six things that come out of the text. Lessons to us. Number one, number one, do not dwell on your past sins, particularly in boasting, to draw attention to yourself. Do not boast of your past sins, particularly in boasting to draw attention to yourself. Dwell on past sins and remember them only if it is to this end 
to magnify the overflowing grace of God to you as the worst of sinners. Rather dwell on and deal with your present sins and weaknesses and with great remorse and repentance. Hate your sin today. Resolve to be done with it and live a life of repentance and faith. Yes, think on your sin. Think on your sin that you committed this week against the light of the gospel. Sins of omission, sins of thought and word and deed. And the psalmist David did this frequently. For you know my transgression and my sin is ever before you. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done evil what is in your sight. And every day create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Do not dwell on your past sins. Deal with your present sins and live as a trophy of God's grace. Number two, number two, do not let your past sins, no matter how great, prevent or cause you to hesitate from coming to Christ. I speak especially to unbelievers here today. Do not let your past sins, no matter how great, prevent you or cause you to hesitate from coming to Christ. There is no sin bigger than God's grace. There is no justice that can prevail over God's mercy in Christ Jesus. His grace abounds to the greatest and the worst of all sinners. When sin abounds, grace abounds even more. The only sin that will bar you from Christ will be the sin of constant rejection and blasphemy against the eternal Son of God, which is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and a rejection of Christ Jesus as the Savior of sinners. If you do not believe that, and until you desert that thought, there is no room, but there is no sin that God's grace cannot overcome. John 6, 37, Jesus' words, all that the Father has given me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, even the dying thief, in the last minute on the cross, you may not have your last minute. Come to me, I will never cast him out. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden with your sin and your guilt and your miserable life, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Number three, lesson Number three, believers magnify the God of all grace for his overflowing grace to you every day. Grace to pray, grace to repent, grace to forgive, grace to believe, grace to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To the King of all ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever. Amen. Number four, number four, unbeliever, I speak to you again this morning. Take hold of this trustworthy statement, worthy of full acceptance. Take hold of it today. No matter how great your sin, it is the free offer of the gospel. It is grace abounding to the greatest and chief of sinners. This saying is trustworthy, deserving of full acceptance, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the foremost. Did you murder? Did you kill? Did you persecute the church of Christ? Did you continually blaspheme against Christ? There is grace for you, overflowing abundance. Come to Christ today. Take a hold of this trustworthy statement. The banks tell you they'll give you interest for a year, great interest. It's not trustworthy. Tomorrow, today it's here, tomorrow it's gone. And all things in this world. But here's a trustworthy statement. Here is one thing. It's a letter with a police stamp on. 
It's indelible. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the foremost. Number five. Number five. There is nothing in your past life before Christ and nothing in your present life of faith and obedience that causes you to merit or earn in any way God's abundant, overflowing grace to you in Christ Jesus. That's a long sentence. There's nothing in your past life before Christ, nothing in your present life of faith and obedience that causes you to merit or earn in any way God's abundant, overflowing grace to you in Christ Jesus. It is free grace to the worst and to the least of the saints. And yet, what a wonder that a life of obedience and service, that your walk of faith accompanied even with trials and infirmities and self-sacrifice will reap a great reward in heaven. What a blessing that is. This also was Paul's testimony before his death. Listen to it. This is part of his testimony. Second Timothy 4 and verse 7. He comes to the end. It's done. Sufferings, persecutions, shipwrecks, the greatest of sinners. God's overflowing grace never stopped to him. And he writes, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. Though we deserve nothing, we deserve infirmity, we deserve trial, we deserve suffering. And yet, what do we get? God's abundant, overflowing grace to us. Sixthly, and finally, sixthly, believer, you are a trophy of God's grace. You receive mercy that others too might believe through your life and example. Be a faithful ambassador. May your life be a trophy of God's grace. That when people know what your former life looked like and they see what you have become in Christ, they too may say, I want to believe on a Savior that can change a man like that. I want to believe on a Savior who changed Paul's life and appointed him as an apostle and gave, gave him strength with the superabundance of God's mercy. This is why we have our former lives, to bring us to that point that others may see and believe because of God's mercy. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect obedience as an example to those who believe in him for eternal life. Brothers and sisters, may the Lord seal this word to our hearts today. May our hearts burst forth with praise for the overflowing grace that is in Christ Jesus. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Mighty God, our Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, each one of us, we are aware with shame of our past sins, of our rebellion against you, of our blasphemy, of our ignorance. Oh Lord, how we thank you for the superabundance of God's grace in Christ Jesus. How we thank you that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the foremost. Oh Lord, help us to be trophies of your grace. Lord, seal these words upon our hearts that we may live lives of obedience faithfulness to you, knowing that there is a great reward, even through the trials and afflictions, temptations, difficulties, and even sin of this life, because of Jesus Christ's superabundant grace and mercy, we worship you in Christ's name.